tardes. Good evening. Welcome. A very warm welcome to Casa Arabe. One more uh, lecture in our cycle in Aula Arabe Universitaria. And uh, today we're focusing on a small but very great country. It's a small because of uh, its area, but it is a great country and a major country in uh, respect of the in regional structure of power. For uh, The title of this conference is Cool Vadis Lebanon. For those of you who don't know Latin, this means where are you going, Lebanon, and how are you doing? That would keep, you know, also be a translation. So the uh, the answer would be well, we're not doing very well actually, and so we will be focusing today on reviewing how uh, Lebanon is doing and where it is going, together with uh, Karim Bitar, who is a researcher at the Institut des Relations Internationales et Stratégiques in Paris. This is uh, something that we are doing together with the master's degree in political science and public affairs at the St. Louis University Madrid campus that is uh, t represented today by the director of uh, the, this master in that university. So for those of you who are here, well, thank you very much for your presence and to, to be here in person. And also thanks to those of you who are following us via uh, YouTube, uh, through the YouTube site of Casa Arabe. So you can listen to this lecture both in either in English or in Spanish um, uh, by means of simultaneous interpretation. Well, since uh, uh, 2020, Lebanon has uh, been uh, in continuous state of crisis uh, from the financial sector, the Lebanese lira has been falling down uh, constantly and uh, this is uh, a situation that has been further aggravated by the current uh, world situation and uh, with the humanitarian consequences this has for the local population, but not only for them, but uh, also for the uh, refugees who actually live in, in Lebanon, uh, around 1.5 million Syrian refugees live there now, and have uh, first they had to endure the COVID pandemic and later the terrible explosion at the port of Beirut that devastated uh, a large number of port infrastructure that uh, are more than ever and more necessary than ever given given the uh, now given the uh, the uh, uh, relationships of with the triad of uh, and uh, the current ukraine war now uh, there's also another an added factor which is the coming upcoming elections um, that will be uh, held next May 15th and uh, hopefully they will uh, this will be an opportunity to respond to the year 2019 protests which demanded an end to the rule by the political elites who have run the country since the end of the civil war and sunk it into uh, the current state of crisis undoubtedly despite the people's protests, uh, as I was saying, many of these uh, parties that uh, were mostly uh, religious, uh, of a religious orientation, did not want to leave their place, did not want to yield power, and uh, we are currently, again, at a very delicate time with a very high corruption rate, with uh, a very uh, uh, significant manipulation of uh, the public opinion in an atmosphere of chaos and uh, illegitimacy that is uh, uh, and uh, there are also many other uh, 
pressures such as the international pressures from actors in the region and as well as outside the region, in, for instance in Europe, France and from the US. So given this um, context and against this background, it could be, it could be, uh, there could be um, a post post election debacle with uh, unforeseen consequences. But uh, to my uh, colleague Karim, who's also named Karim, the same as I am, um, uh, I'm now going to uh, give the floor to them. He is not only a researcher at the IRS in Paris, but also an editor of the French monthly magazine Lena Orlemur. He's also an associate member of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, GCSP, and associate research at the Institute Institut Media in Brussels. He's also a professor of international relations and history of political thought at several universities, and he also frequently uh, appears before the foreign affairs committees of the French and the European Parliament. He's authored very chapters and articles in Le Monde Diplomatique, Libération, Le Monde Informe. And for comment, Atlantico, La Vanguardia, Anne Nahar, Lorien Le Jour, as well as editing and co writing the collected book Regard sur la France, in which 30 personalities from around the world analyze France's strengths and weaknesses. So now I'm going to give him the floor, but also I'm going to give the floor to Mikhail, uh, who's going to tell us why, uh, why um, this uh, lecture now. Um, and uh, in this and why is uh, the uh, University of St. Louis uh, so interested in, in uh, doing this now in English or in Spanish as you wish. Thank everybody. So first of all, I would like to thank Casa Arabe and the Programa Aula for this cooperation. We've been two years now working together and having the pleasure of organizing uh, a conference together. I would also like, of course, to thank the presence of all of you, starting with the MA of Political Science and Public Affairs with a concentration in, uh, in International Relations and Crisis. The director of the MA, Dr. Simona Renta, that is with us also today. And basically, before I thank also Karim, and I add some words to, to what, uh, to what uh, Karim Hauser just said, uh, I would just like to say that, yeah, when it comes to our MA and the concentration of, in crisis, uh, it's an MA that we launched two years ago, an MA that focuses on the notion of crisis and bringing crisis to contemporary affairs Obviously, I mean, there is a big choice, I would say, to make when it comes to the current situations that are ongoing in the world and that make us just wonder about where we would be heading. So, I mean, among the many things that we see circulating, for example, this bad joke that tells us that, for example, COVID is behind, but World War III is here. Now, we always have something to focus on, always bad news to be there. And within this, within the program that we have with Casa Arabe, we thought also, uh, I mean, we, the obvious is that there is no one and only crisis in the MENA region. Unfortunately, I think that crises have become structural and have been structural since a long time ago in the MENA region, but thinking about what is ongoing, thinking about what happened while we are still building on this wave called the wave of the Arab Spring, where we see some countries that have entered in transition, other countries that uh, have not gotten to the end of their transitions, other countries also where it's blurry when it comes to the global situation that prevails there. Well, one country that definitely uh, definitely, I would say, draws the attention of the international community, and it is not something new, is definitely the case of Lebanon. If I had to take it from uh, a personal experience, I mean, part of my track and my Arabic studies was, were based on a Lebanese program, that's long years ago, and we, we were always were always presented, or Lebanon was always presented to us as being kind of this country that always wanted the, uh, to be the Switzerland of the Middle East and never got there. And this is back in the 80s. And in the 80s, we had a civil war, or a so-called civil war, and actually what Karim Hauser just talked about uh, reminds us of the fact that unfortunately, 
Lebanon only has two neighbors, which happen to be, I mean, land neighbor by land, which happen to be Syria and Israel, and this is where it is stuck somewhere between many of the contradictions and the confrontations and the problems of the, uh, of the region. But the more we moved into history, or the more we got closer to where we are today in 2022, and the more we realized that we saw also that there, were, there, was, a, there was a multi-layered crisis, actually, that had accumulated in, in Lebanon. We could talk about political crisis, we can talk about economic crisis, Crisis. We can talk about social crisis. There is the, the, the impact of the, of the sectarian system also that has been maintained in Lebanon all through the decades since the independence of Lebanon that also have an, an importance. And I mean, also what, what can call our attention is the fact that it is as if the ghosts of the past remain or came up to the present. The names of the past are the same today. We can talk about Najib Miqati or about, about Michel Aoun or about even some organizations, Hezbollah, for example, that, that remain structural in the Lebanese context. But at the end of the day, if there is something that renews itself, unfortunately, it is the problems of Lebanon, meaning that there is always a new problem happening. There is always a new situation, a new dire situation that is, that is happening there. And so this is, this is where we thought that Lebanon would be definitely this country that we hear a lot about, but that we even heard maybe more about these last few years with all the events that Karim has reminded us of uh, in, his, in his presentation or his introduction. And so all of this just deserves stopping there for some minutes, for an hour or so, and just understanding where Lebanon stands from things and why Lebanon keeps stuck in these contradictions. So without further ado, I would just like to add to what uh, Karim Hauser um, said that, yeah, uh, Karim Bitar is a friend and a colleague at the same time. And what I always like to remind people of is that apart from Lebanon that he's going to talk about, he's definitely knowledgeable about many of the interactions and the intertwining points that there are in the MENA region, meaning that I think that we have definitely here an expertise that we need, an expertise that is uh, invaluable. And this is why we thank you very much for having come, uh, for coming from Beirut to here to talk about, uh, to us about Lebanon. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bara, for your kind introduction. Thank you, uh, Karim. Uh, uh, I am very happy to be here, to be back at uh, Casa Arabe. Uh, I was telling uh, my old friend Bara that I still vividly remember a conference that was organized by Karim Hauser uh, and uh, uh, Casa Arabe in Cordoba in the early stages of the Arab Spring, where they brought together uh, 20 to 30 academics, journalists, uh, experts, and and uh, it was a most interesting conference because we were still in the phase where we had a lot of hopes. The hopes and dreams have been crashed. Today we are in the midst of a full-fledged counter-revolution. Uh, every single uh, country in uh, the Arab world and uh, North Africa is uh, in deep crisis. Authoritarianism is back in force. Tunisia, which was perhaps uh, the, uh, arguably the only example of a democratic transition underway, uh, is back to square one. Uh, you probably know that last week uh, uh, President Kaiser Said uh, has uh, uh, dissolved uh, the parliament. He is showing uh, an increasing authoritarian bent. And a few months ago, we also had the military taking over in Sudan, and uh, one could argue that this is perhaps, uh, it was perhaps the last nail in the coffin of those uh, Arab uprisings of uh, 2011. What was interesting in 2011 is that uh, uh, two countries were conspicuously absent from the debate, uh, Lebanon and Palestine for a while. Uh, you know, if you uh, attend international uh, conferences and uh, seminars, uh, very often uh, in the 1980s, 70s, 90s, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian question was always hotly debated, was always at the center of the event. And after the uh, events in Tunisia and in Egypt and in Libya and in Syria, people 
tended to forget uh, the centrality of the Palestinian question. And another question, another country that was uh, a bit forgotten at the time was Lebanon, because in Lebanon, even though we witnessed a few minor demonstrations in 2011 uh, asking for uh, the, to dismantle the sectarian regime, Ashab Yurid Isqat al Nizam al Ta'ifi, the slogan of the Arab revolutions, if you remember, was the people want to bring down the regimes. Uh, uh, our colleague Gilbert Ashkar gave uh, this uh, as a title to his book, the Ashab you read, the people want. In Lebanon, uh, there were demonstrations asking in particularly to bring down sectarianism, but it was a short-lived protest movement, and it's only uh, 10 years later that Lebanon is back in the news for a series of reasons. Karim Hauser has mentioned them very clearly. An unprecedented economic and financial crisis, according to the World Bank, it's one of the three worst crises since 1850 in the entire world an unprecedented uh, hyperinflation, uh, depreciation of the national currency. Uh, we witnessed in 2019 uh, a popular uprising that was extremely promising, where we saw large swathes of the Lebanese population from all regions, from all sects, demonstrating massively in major cities to uh, demand a new social contract in Lebanon, a new social contract that would no longer be based on sectarianism, but rather on this idea of citizenship, which is a new idea in the Arab world. When I say a new idea, it's in the sense, uh, obviously, uh, many, uh, many thinkers uh, going uh, back centuries have started to plant the seeds of this idea of citizenship. However, we could say that not uh, even beyond the Arab world, even if you look at Turkey, at Israel, at Iran, you have very few examples where you have a direct relationship between the individual and the state where you are considered a citizen and not exclusively as a member of one particular sect. We have this tendency uh, that is, remains very widespread in Europe and North America to look at the Middle East through uh, uh, ethnographic lenses to see exclusively Shiites, Sunnis, Druze, Maronites, etc., as if they were different species, even though they have an awful lot in common, they have a long history of coexistence, and recently uh, historian uh, Usama Makdesi uh, published an interesting book on uh, the age of coexistence in the Middle East. Uh, however, this Orientalist lens remains predominant in Western media. Uh, we tend, when we are in Europe, where we are in the United States, to view the Arab world as a monolithic mass and to think that everything that happens in between Morocco and Indonesia is directly the result of some Quranic verse of some religious text rather than the result of geopolitical, social, economic, demographic causes. This is what is known in academia as theologocentrism. Uh, this is how Maxime Rodinson defined it. It remains, uh, unfortunately, present. And when we analyze Lebanon, when Western academics, Western journalists analyze Lebanon, they consistently bring us back to this idea that you are a member uh, of one particular sect and that you are supposed to think in a certain way, to act in a certain way because of this uh, uh, religious or sectarian belonging. So this is why I started by mentioning citizenship. One of the reasons why the uprising of 2019 was exhilarating to uh, a lot of youth in Lebanon is that for the first time they had the impression that they were protesting as citizens, demanding dignity, demanding equal rights, demanding an end 
to uh, economic injustice, demanding uh, uh, a better equilibrium between uh, the cities and the rural areas, and most importantly, uh, demanding uh, uh, to bring down a corrupt political and financial oligarchy that had literally looted uh, Lebanon. Uh, this, uh, let me start perhaps by this uh, cartoon that was published uh, uh, a few uh, months ago on the front page of Le Monde. It's an Arab cartoonist, but you know that uh, after uh, the famed uh, French cartoonist Plantu retired, he offered the front page cartoon to his association, Cartooning for Peace, and every day you have one cartoonist from uh, a different part of the world. And this one is particularly uh, uh, sad for us Lebanese because it is a reflection of what has happened in the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, this country uh, was uh, relatively uh, prosperous, even though uh, inequalities have always been uh, very present in Lebanon. Uh, Bara mentioned uh, the old cliché of the Switzerland of the Middle East. Others called Beirut the Paris of the East. Uh, all these clichés do not resist analysis because even in the so-called golden era in the 1950s, 1960s, early 70s, you had massive uh, inequalities and you had a tiny privileged elite that was relatively well off, that was connected to the West. This is why uh, we had this impression that Lebanon was relatively well off at the time, a, a relatively uh, liberal uh, democratic parliamentary regimes at a time when most neighboring countries were ruled by authoritarian cliques. Unfortunately, behind this facade of a parliamentary liberal democracy, uh, Lebanon was still, uh, uh, was and is still governed by a very archaic uh, political formula of power sharing between uh, uh, communities. It was known as consociative democracy or consociationalism. Uh, and uh, initially, the idea was uh, that it was necessary to appease the existential angst of the various communities. So to give them guarantees that they will not be overruled, that uh, will, they will always be able to take part in government. So uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, the Lebanese uh, system who wrote the con Lebanese constitution is an interesting thinker whose name was Michel Shiha. He is uh, uh, someone who wrote uh, very uh, prescient uh, articles about Palestine in the 1930s and early 1940s warning about the dispossession of the Palestinian people. But the same Michel Shiha was also uh, a precursor uh, of uh, what is called today neoliberalism. He perceived Lebanon as uh, a merchant's republic. This would be uh, used later by political scientists. But he basically had this idea that laissez faire economics was the appropriate system. So Lebanon was supposed to be an intermediary between East and West, was supposed to be an oasis of freedom, but uh, you were not perceived as a citizen. You were part of what he called spiritual families, al-ha'ilat al-ruhiya. And this is something that today's Lebanese youth are trying to break off with. They want to be citizens living in a modern, democratic, strong state. They no longer want to be identified exclusively by their sectarian belongings. So this is why they protested against this uh, oligarchy, this kleptocracy. And uh, we realized in 1970, well, actually, we didn't realize we knew it all along, but that uh, we were going broke. Uh, 
the French president uh, himself used the expression Ponzi scheme. The governor of the central bank had set up an unsustainable uh, system that uh, started in the 1990s after the Lebanese uh, civil war ended when uh, the Saudi Lebanese uh, businessman Rafiq Hariri became prime minister in 1992. Neoliberalism became uh, the name of the game in Lebanon. Uh, it was a rent-based economy. Fundamental sectors like agriculture and industry were completely uh, forgotten. Lebanon did not invest in its productive sectors, in the knowledge economy, in job-creating industries, everything was focused on real estate, on tourism, on services, on the banking and financial industry. And uh, it was unsustainable. And when uh, the rising geopolitical tensions uh, in the region uh, intensified uh, uh, following uh, 2016, uh, the system was bound to collapse. They bought some time by resorting to so-called financial engineering, uh, trying to attract capital from abroad, offering extremely high interest rates. So it was a typical Ponzi scheme, even though many Lebanese bankers are still in denial and refuse uh, to accept the expression, and it ended up collapsing. Uh, so there is an awakening today that Lebanon cannot be analyzed exclusively through the prism of the geopolitical context. Of course, we are going to talk today about the geopolitical context, the uh, regional proxy wars. However, there are also structural problems that have to do with the way the Lebanese social and economic system was built. It was built uh, in order to protect the interest of a tiny minority of Lebanese uh, uh, business elites and uh, uh, disenfranchised masses were often forgotten, kept out of the picture. Uh, so in the past two years, we witnessed an unprecedented uh, devaluation of the currency, uh, hyperinflation. Uh, the World Bank estimates that uh, the poverty rate today in Lebanon is over 75% of the Lebanese population. Some figures are really uh, uh, shocking. Uh, the latest UNICEF reports uh, tells you that one out of three Lebanese children uh, goes to bed without having had dinner, uh, ha uh, has to skip meals. This is in a country that was perceived, as Barat said, as uh, a relatively uh, developed, prosperous uh, uh, Switzerland ersatz in the Middle East. And today, poverty is on the rise, inequality is on the rise, and the geopolitical context that I'm sure you are familiar with is particularly grim. So I will start by mentioning, before we go back to this kleptocracy that has been described as a redistributive kleptocracy by academics like uh, Hassan Salame of uh, Sciences Po in Paris, why did he call it a redistributive kleptocracy? Because uh, these Lebanese oligarchs, sectarian leaders, feudal lords, business elites do not only practice elite capture, like uh, ha uh, what happens in other places, uh, uh, in many other countries, but they do indeed redistribute uh, part of the amounts that were siphoned out to their own clientelist networks. And this is why they are still in power today. This is why the system is so resilient. The word resilience has been used ad nauseam uh, to speak about the Lebanese people. Uh, it's uh, one of the most persistent cliches in Western media, the resilience of the Lebanese people. And most Lebanese today are sick and tired of hearing the word resilience because they ended up realizing that they were literally exhausted, that they were at the end of the rope and that those who were really resilient were their sectarian leaders. So the state in Lebanon is extremely weak. It has never been strong enough to tame the private interests uh, and uh, to keep them at bay. However, 
if the state is weak, it does not mean that the regime is weak. The regime in Lebanon is actually one of the strongest regimes in Lebanon. You have, uh, you know, today the, the expression deep state has become uh, also a bit of a cliche and is overused. Uh, it was used initially uh, about Turkey and then uh, every single country uh, talks about its own deep state. But in Lebanon, we do indeed have a deep state which is made of uh, a network of political leaders, uh, business elites, uh, importers, uh, uh, members of the security apparatus, etc. And they are the ones really ruling the country. So behind the facade of a liberal democracy, the Lebanese system is no longer today a consociational democracy, and I'm very critical of consociational democracy to begin with, but until a few years ago we could argue that consociational democracy was poorly put in practice, uh, poorly interpreted. But today uh, it is no longer a consociational democracy, it is a, an oligarchic system where you have six or seven uh, sectarian leaders, uh, billionaires, uh, former warlords who are uh, actually ruling the country. Uh, you no longer have uh, intra-sectarian democracy within every community and within every political party you have one person or two persons deciding. So uh, even the facade of a liberal democracy is crumbling. Now, it is extremely difficult to talk about Lebanon without mentioning the global geopolitical context. We are living in an age of fragmentation, of state collapse. Throughout uh, the Middle East and North Africa, non-state actors are becoming much more powerful than uh, governments and states. Several countries are on the verge of full-scale disintegration. We uh, have big question marks about the future of Libya, the future of Yemen, uh, even though uh, uh, the situation in Iraq and Syria uh, is uh, arguably a little better than it was uh, two or three years ago. These countries are still at risk. We have uh, a global uh, geopolitical trend with age centrifugal forces, forces and the weakening of central authorities. So these non-state actors are setting the agenda in several countries, in Lebanon, in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, and Libya. The entire territorial framework that was born after World War I is beginning to shatter. I do not think many people argued a few years ago that we were witnessing the end of Sykes-Picot and that we were going to see new borders in uh, the Middle East and uh, in the early stages of the war in Syria. Many people uh, started uh, speaking of a so-called Alawite state and a Sunni state and uh, in Lebanon uh, uh, on the fringes uh, of uh, the political spectrum, you have many people who would also uh, prefer to live in uh, uh, homogeneous, small sectarian enclaves. But uh, as uh, you know, as students of international relations, it is increasingly difficult to redraw borders. The only examples in the past 20 years turned out to be disastrous, uh, whether Kosovo or South Sudan. So. Uh, partitioning uh, the Middle East along sectarian lines, as uh, I was mentioning fringes, but today it's no longer the fringes. Uh, these uh, uh, discourses are becoming mainstream. Many people are starting to openly uh, call for partition or sometimes for uh, federalism uh, or a confederate system. Uh, I think it is uh, quite uh, uh, a delusion because uh, the history of this part of the world shows the imbrication of communities. Uh, you simply uh, cannot uh, put uh, people in sectarian ghettos. Uh, people uh, are particularly the youth have become uh, increasingly vocal, demanding 
uh, in evolution towards a civil state. Uh, some of them plead for secularism, even though uh, the expression is sometimes still negatively connotated in the Arab world. But one of the main demands of the October 2019 uprising was to put an end to sectarianism. So, uh, why was I saying that it's impossible to disconnect the Lebanese situation from the regional uh, trends? It's because, unfortunately, Lebanon was unable to move towards secularism, even in the 1970s, when most neighboring Arab countries were ruled by uh, secular regimes, even though it was uh, authoritarian secularism. Uh, what's his name? Our colleague uh, Pierre-Jean Luizard wrote a book about uh, uh, authoritarian secularism in uh, the Middle East and North Africa. He studied the cases of Ataturk in Turkey, of Bourguiba in Tunisia, of course of Hafez al-Assad and uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, the Iraqi and Syrian Ba'ath parties. Uh, even though in the 1970s, there was a wide segment of the Lebanese population uh, also pleading against sectarianism and uh, trying to move towards a secular system. It proved to be uh, quite a challenge. So today, it will be even more difficult because throughout the region, we have a rise of religious uh, and uh, identitarian uh, politics. Uh, we are witnessing uh, also uh, the statization of armed groups and the militiaization of states. Uh, certain groups have become much more powerful than states uh, they operate in, and a contrario, uh, certain regimes are behaving like militias. So uh, another uh, trend uh, that Lebanon has to uh, reflect upon is that hyper-centralized states have collapsed, and yet very few structures exist to rebuild social cohesion. So the challenge today in Lebanon is to invent a new formula of living together that would not lead to deepening the sectarian divide, but that would perhaps alleviate the angst of certain communities. So the constitution uh, that uh, was never implemented in Lebanon, uh, imagined a mechanism that could be used to reach this. Uh, we would basically abolish sectarianism in the lower house and create an upper house, a senate, where all communities would be represented. You would give guarantees to the communities, but then you would have a new generation uh, uh, of uh, lawmakers that would enter the lower house. They would be uh, uh, men and women uh, trying to focus mostly on social economic issues, on rebuilding a new coherent nation, rather than constantly nagging about their communities communal rights. Uh, in the past few years, the Lebanese political discourse has become suffocating if you are not an identitarian religious bigot, because all, all political leaders constantly speak of the right of their communities, the right of Christians, the right of Sunnis, the rights of Shiites, at a time when neither Christians, nor Sunnis, nor Shiites have more than two hours of electricity per day, at a time when all of them have lost uh, their uh, savings because of the collapse of this financial system, and at a time when uh, the Lebanese national sovereignty has become uh, a delusion because Lebanon is constantly in the midst of these regional proxy wars. So, uh, there are many reasons to be pessimistic in the current context, unlike the context I was talking about 2011, because today the counter-revolution has triumphed throughout the region. Even the few countries that uh, have weathered the Arab Spring drew the wrong lessons, hardened repression, police states are back in force, and this is true not only for anti-West uh, regimes, it is also true for many uh, pro-Western uh, Gulf countries that are perceived favorably in Western media. Uh, there are also countries where you could go to jail because of a joke you cracked on Twitter. So uh, how to maintain Lebanon as a relatively free, democratic, liberal country uh, when you have these global uh, trends throughout the region, 
is a bit like uh, solving uh, an impossible equation. Uh, at the core of this uh, regional uh, uh, tug of war is what we can call the new Middle East proxy wars. It's in reference to this book you see uh, right here uh, that was published in the 19, uh, in the, uh, uh, about the period going uh, from uh, uh, 1952 to 1970, the Arab Cold War. Uh, Malcolm Kerr, the author of this book, was an American political scientist who was born in Beirut and who uh, was assassinated in Beirut. He was the head of the American University of Beirut and he was uh, killed in 1984. Uh, he uh, was not known for uh, uh, several uh, interesting articles he wrote, uh, uh, studying uh, uh, international relations, orientalism, etc. But he became famous particularly for this book, analyzing uh, the, the tensions between the Arab nationalist secular camp of Gamal Abdel Nasser and his rivals, the pro-American uh, reactionary uh, Saudi uh, camp mostly. What we are witnessing today is a resurgence of this regional Cold War. It is no longer an Arab Cold War because you have a new actor, which is Iran, that has moved after the 1979 revolution from quietest Shi'ism to revolutionary Shi'ism. Uh, Hamid Dabashi uh, of uh, Columbia University uh, uh, wrote uh, interesting uh, pages about Shi'ism as a uh, trend that has, as a, uh, this trend in Shi'ism that has always encouraged rebellion, a revolutionary spirit. And after 1979, uh, there was a clean break within Shiism, and quietism has basically been replaced by a revolutionary Shiism, and the Iranian regime, uh, Dabashi is uh, a vehement critic of the Iranian regime, uh, has, even though he is also a uh, uh, very critical of US foreign policies, the Iranian regime has tried to export its revolution. Uh, so. Uh, the turning point was 2003, after uh, the uh, illegal invasion of Iraq by uh, the United States and uh, Great Britain, uh, George W. Bush and Tony Blair. Uh, the results uh, were, as you know, absolutely uh, disastrous. It wa this war that was supposed to bring democracy to the Middle East, according to uh, the Washington DC warmongers and chicken hawks that promoted this war, it ended up, basically, it led to uh, the death of uh, uh, several hundred thousand Iraqi civilians. Some people even tell you that it could be close to a million Iraqi civilians if you analyze it in terms of excess deaths, like uh, uh, the British medical journal The Lancet did a few years ago. It led to the fragmentation of the country, paradoxically uh, to a significant increase of Iranian influence in the region, and you have the same warmongers who were in favor of the Iraq war today uh, pleading for an intervention to curb uh, Iranian, the growth of Iranian power that uh, the 2003 war basically uh, provoked. Uh, as a reaction to this rise of uh, Iranian influence after 2003, uh, Sunni, uh, pro-American Sunni Gulf countries grew increasingly uh, feverish, increasingly uh, belligerent, and also tried to contain this uh, Iranian influence. So today, uh, I tend to agree with Gregory Gauss, even though um, uh, what he writes about Saudi Arabia uh, uh, is often uh, perhaps uh, per, uh, too soft on uh, the Saudi establishment, but I think he was right when he said that the best framework for understanding the regional politics of the Middle East today is as a Cold War between uh, in which Iran and Saudi Arabia play the leading roles. These two actors do not confront one, uh, each other militarily, but rather it is a contest for influence playing out 
in the domestic political systems of several regions. And why is this important to Lebanon? Because Lebanon is one of the countries where we are witnessing this massively. It's not only Lebanon, of course, it's also Iraq, Syria, uh, Libya, uh, uh, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain. In every one of these five countries, you have basically, uh, to simplify, one political camp that is uh, supported, financed, armed by Iran, and another camp that is uh, financed, protected by uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, many cartoonists uh, uh, illustrated this uh, confrontation. Uh, uh, I like uh, Cal, the economist's cartoonist, and here you see these two regional behemoths fighting with uh, uh, Yemen and Syria as a puppet. It could have been Lebanon, uh, Iraq, Bahrain. And you have someone in the audience asking, how long will the fight last? And the response is, only 14 or 15, obviously he's not referring to uh, boxing rounds, he's referring to centuries because there is constantly the fear that this Saudi regional confrontation, which is a geopolitical confrontation, it is not an ethnic, it is not a sectarian rivalry, it is not Arabs versus Persians or Sunnis versus Shiites, however, it could lead to deepening these sectarian tensions, and no country is escaping this new Middle East proxy war, particularly Lebanon. Uh, uh, Karim mentioned that we were going to have elections on May 15. Well, uh, in the elections of 2009, 13 years ago already, it was estimated by an official Lebanese publication uh, of the finance ministry that uh, you had uh, incoming capital flows amounting to no less than $1.2 billion. Uh, obviously, we do not have a paper trail, but uh, it is plausible that Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, spent approximately 700 million on one side, 500 million or on the other side to support their uh, Lebanese allies. So uh, this Iranian-Saudi confrontation has reached a stage where these regional powers are ready to spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars to win a parliamentary seat in a remote area of Lebanon. It has become uh, absolutely central and very few uh, public figures in Lebanon uh, are genuinely independent from one of these two countries. Some of them are very critical of Iran, of Iranian uh, influence, they call it Iranian occupation, but they uh, suddenly uh, disappear uh, and they do not find the courage to publish a single tweet criticizing uh, Jamal Khashoggi's assassination. The same is true on the other side. Many people uh, blame uh, Saudi Arabia for its uh, a subservience towards the United States of America, but uh, go uh, MIA when Iran uh, supports uh, 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 Bashar al-Assad in Syria, when Iran uh, uh, insists that Hezbollah and uh, uh, Shiite Iraqi militias uh, go to Syria and take part in a civil war. So you have this uh, constant attempt at uh, 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 constant uh, meddling of uh, uh, Iranian and Saudis uh, in Lebanese politics, which is, uh, uh, which uh, influence cannot be underestimated and proving uh, disastrous. Uh, the entire this uh, cartoon is also interesting because it shows that just on the chessboard you, you don't only have small countries like Lebanon or Jordan or Palestine, you also have uh, an Iranian-Saudi confrontation taking place in Washington DC uh, through lobbying firms, taking place in the UK, uh, taking place in uh, several other countries. So perhaps in a few months, uh, we might witness a détente if uh, the uh, U.S.-Iranian negotiations in Vienna uh, lead uh, to a uh, 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 to uh, 
a renewal of the JCPOA, but it could also lead to an increasingly Saudi harsh stance because Saudi Arabia uh, is constantly afraid that uh, its US patron will abandon it if it gets into a stronger relationship with Iran. So in this context, Lebanon is facing unprecedented political uh, gridlock, an economic crisis that uh, has impoverished uh, uh, the masses, and uh, there is also a structural problem, which is a governance problem. We simply do not have constitutional mechanisms to solve the crisis. The Lebanese political system has become completely dysfunctional. Uh, you have a political sclerosis. You have this intense polarization that is partly related to the Saudi-Iranian uh, proxy war, but that also has uh, domestic ramifications. Uh, some people consider that uh, uh, the United States uh, and uh, the blockade it has imposed uh, is uh, uh, the main culprit in uh, uh, the crisis that Lebanon is going through today, and others consider that uh, Hezbollah's hubris, Hezbollah's intervention in the war in Syria and in Yemen and elsewhere uh, should uh, be uh, blamed primarily because they led uh, Sunni uh, countries that used to offer financial support to Lebanon to basically withdraw uh, completely. And in the past two years, uh, several Gulf countries have asked their ambassadors to leave the country for months on end because they consider that Hezbollah has become a predominant force in Lebanon and that uh, it is simply uh, impossible to protect their interests even though they have spent uh, billions in Lebanon uh, starting in the 1990s. Uh, so the Lebanese central authorities are increasingly weak, not only because of the financial bankruptcy, but also because of uh, the considerable strength of uh, Hezbollah. And uh, we have reached a situation where this is all having a very heavy toll on uh, the mental health of the Lebanese people. Even two years ago, before uh, the Beirut uh, blast, which was the third uh, biggest blast in history, if you exclude nuclear explosions like uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, even before this blast and before the crisis that erupted in 2019, you already have, uh, you already had a, an alarming number of suicides in Lebanon. And those are official figures. Uh, we have to keep in mind that these figures are severely, uh, probably under evaluated in the Middle East because of the stigma attached to suicide. So many suicides are disguised as someone having fallen from the balcony or uh, a car accident or whatever. So you have today a situation of exhaustion. I see it uh, at my university. All of our students are uh, tired, depressed, our professors. Uh, we are all uh, exhausted. Uh, and uh, this is one of the issues that is not getting enough attention. Uh, it is arguably the most important, most pressing issue today, particularly uh, after the trauma that was caused by the Beirut uh, blast. The Lebanese psychiatrist uh, tweeted yesterday that uh, he was still uh, in constant touch with uh, dozens of patients who still suffer from post-traumatic stress after April 4th. Another point I wanted to mention today, even though it seems uh, a bit unrelated, is that the main problem in Lebanon is that a peaceful revolution was always made impossible. And this, uh, as John F. Kennedy said, those who make peaceful revolution impossible will make violent revolution inevitable. We are approaching a situation where we could see violence in Lebanon. And I'm not speaking about uh, uh, a new uh, revolution with uh, a few uh, persons going uh, overboard. Uh, 
we have had a 60% decrease in GDP in the past two years. If you look at uh, uh, worldwide experiences, there are simply no cases where you have such a severe economic crisis, 60%, you lose 60% of GDP without uh, having uh, ulteriorly, uh, in an ulterior phase, uh, a security deterioration or a major crisis or a war. Uh, so today, uh, Lebanon is uh, at the crossroads. It, is, it has always been at the crossroads. It has become a cliche. But if Lebanon does not really manage to find a way to bring systemic structural reforms and obtain uh, a new political system, there is really a risk of a new violent revolution. We uh, literally uh, can no longer pay our diplomats. For the past two months, the Lebanese ambassador in Paris, in, new, uh, in Washington DC, in Madrid, uh, these ambassadors have not been paid. Uh, none of the staffers, uh, none of the diplomats have been paid. Uh, the situation will get even worse in a couple of months. The reserves of the, for, of the central bank have, uh, are depleted. Yesterday, uh, the vice prime minister uh, recognized that the central bank was literally broke and that the Lebanese state was broke. But uh, uh, an hour later, the prime minister backpedaled. And you know, as I say, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. Many people in Lebanon, in the financial establishment, are still in denial, are refusing to acknowledge the obvious is that this country is bankrupt and might not even be able to, uh, uh, to weather uh, the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, for example, because 95% of Lebanese wheat comes from Russia or Ukraine. Lebanon, of all the Arab countries, is the most vulnerable one. So we have 45 days of stocks, but there is a genuine risk of uh, famine in a country that has a history, uh, a traumatic history with famine, because during World War I, one out of three persons living in Mount Lebanon, it was before the proclamation of the state of Great Lebanon, one out of three persons died of hunger. It was taboo for a very long time and people would not acknowledge it. They would prefer to tell you that uh, their grandfather died fighting the Ottomans than acknowledging that he died of hunger. And uh, the cold hard truth is that uh, during uh, this period between 1914 and 1920, Lebanon was uh, suffocating because of geopolitical circumstances, uh, an Ottoman blockade, but also because of the greed of part of the Lebanese uh, business elites who hoarded uh, basic necessities and tried to make a quick buck out of it. And uh, an important uh, novel in Arabic literature is called Ar Raghif by Tufi Yusuf Awad and tells the story of uh, uh, people uh, uh, having uh, to uh, sell uh, all their possessions uh, literally uh, to eat. So at the time you had also uh, weather conditions, a cricket uh, invasion. Today, a century later, again you have geopolitical circumstances, the US-Iranian confrontation, you have uh, coronavirus, and you have the same uh, greed of the same business elites in Lebanon. Uh, so the problem is simultaneously a problem of uh, uh, international relations, a problem of uh, uh, injustice and inability of the Lebanese masses to mobilize against a tiny minority uh, trying to uh, uh, make uh, huge financial gains in times of crisis. And this is at the core of what we are going through today. Uh, after the collapse of 2019, uh, Lebanon suddenly woke up to the hard reality that it had basically 70 to 80 billion dollars that had disappeared. So the main debate became on how 
how to allocate these losses. And then we witnessed something really very peculiar and very interesting. We witnessed an unholy alliance of all sectarian political parties that came together, ganged up, in order to torpedo an economic rescue plan that would have protected the savings of 95% of Lebanese depositors. So basically, you had the preceding government prevented, presented an economic rescue plan that was elaborated in collaboration with a French uh, uh, bank, uh, Banque Lazare, and uh, following uh, IMF uh, uh, criteria, uh, the idea was to go to the IMF to negotiate a package deal, but also uh, to take the initiative and allocate the losses fairly. And this is when we witnessed this unholy alliance, and within parliament, we saw members of parliament uh, that be belong to sectarian parties close to Iran, and members of parliament that belong to other sectarian parties supported by the US and Saudi Arabia joining forces in order to torpedo these negotiations with the IMF in order to protect some vested interests, the interests of uh, some of the shareholders of the country's major banks who were trying to socialize their losses after having privatized their profits for the past 30 years. So uh, during the period going from 1992 basically to 2019, you had a, uh, an elite, a phenomenon of elite capture. Uh, a lot of people got very rich thanks to these interest rates that I told you about. And suddenly when the system collapsed, they uh, used every dirty trick in the book to make sure that the average citizen would pay the price and that they would not uh, have to uh, accept uh, a bail-in. They wanted to be bailed out by uh, the state and they are still lobbying to sell all state assets that belong to all Lebanese, even the 50% of the Lebanese who do not have a bank account, and you still have a very intense lobbying pressure by these uh, uh, deep state forces that I was evoking in order to socialize their losses. So if you look at Lebanese history, and this is why I, uh, I, I like this uh, John F. Kennedy quote, we realize that every single attempt to reform the system from within uh, all the liberal Democrats or all the progressives that tried to bring some uh, minor reforms were uh, very rapidly confronted by very powerful vested interests. So we had an interesting experience at the end of the 1950s, between 1958 and the late 1960s. There was an attempt to create a strong central state to uh, have a minimum of social justice to have institutions. Uh, it was called the Shehabist experience after the, the name of uh, uh, the president Fuad Shehab. And these reforms were very rapidly torpedoed by the sectarian establishment and by the business elites of the days. Same thing happened in the 70s. The same thing happened uh, in the late 1990s. Whenever there was an attempt at imposing a minimum uh, of regulations to protect uh, the weak, to bring some social justice, some economic development. Uh, the Lebanese uh, business elites, uh, in cahoots with the Lebanese uh, sectarian establishment and in cahoots with uh, uh, religious figures often, uh, succeeded in uh, 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 managed to torpedo every reform initiative. And this is why we have reached the stage where many people believe that change will not come from within, that it is impossible to reform this system democratically, and we are seeing some groups that are becoming increasingly radical, and this is why uh, the coming months uh, could be uh, quite dangerous. Uh, there were some hopes placed, uh, I think it was misplaced on the Lebanese legislative elections. Many people uh, deluded themselves into 
thinking that uh, uh, there is it's also a tendency that is partly uh, can partly be blamed on this uh, uh, Western uh, zeitgeist that tends to fetishize uh, the ballot box, think that uh, elections can bring change. Unfortunately, when you live in a country where you have a 75% uh, poverty rate, and when you live in a country where the main politicians are uh, billionaires, when you live in a country that has no sovereignty, where the notion of citizenship is not present, it is extremely hard to reform the system, to bring significant change through an electoral process. Uh, add to this that the electoral process is deeply flawed based on an electoral law that it that is a travesty. They were supposed to introduce propor proportional representation to allow the emergence of new uh, non-sectarian political movement. And they managed to uh, devise this law in such a pernicious way that this law has ended up uh, re-legitimizing and empowering the old sectarian uh, elites. Uh, so this constant dialectic between reform and revolution, between social democracy and uh, revolutionary thought is very present in Lebanon. And unfortunately, uh, Lebanon is a country where you have uh, many conservatives, where you have many uh, radicals, uh, the Lebanese Communist Party was established, uh, was one of the uh, earliest uh, experiences, so it goes way back. Uh, but uh, what is conspicuously absent in Lebanon is the social democratic tradition. Uh, you don't really have a center left in Lebanon or a center right. You have uh, conservatives, whether religious conservatives or uh, uh, people who are absolutely in favor of uh, laissez faire when it comes to the economy. Uh, you have those who want to bring down the entire system and who do not believe in democratic change, but you have very few people who have uh, attempted to uh, lay the ground for a uh, uh, democratic turnover. We never had after the end of the civil war in 1989, a turnover. It's actually uh, national unity governments that are almost uh, permanently in office. Initially, the idea was that in the name of political realism, to bring together uh, all militias, all sectarian groups, in order to uh, get them uh, to accept uh, to willingly relinquish their weapons. But then it became some sort of a constitutional heresy, and every single government today, almost everyone, uh, joins political antagonists. The government becomes some sort of mini parliament. Uh, so before I, I go back to this, let me very rapidly recap. I'm going to ask yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. I would like to take uh, questions because uh, there are so many uh, issues that uh, I will not have time to dwell upon. I just want to uh, uh, tell you why, in my opinion, 2019 was a turning point. Because throughout history, uh, a national unity always came from above in Lebanon. In 1920, uh, the French High Commissioner General Gouraud brought together the Maronite patriarch, uh, Elias Lahwayik, who was seated to his right and to his left, the Sunni Mufti Mustafa Naja. And it was the proclamation of the state of Great Lebanon. In 1943, once again, it was a national unity between two leaders, a Maronite leader, President Bashar al-Khouri, and the Sunni leader, Riyadh al-Suluh. In 1989, at the end of uh, the Lebanese civil war, uh, the remaining uh, members of parliament uh, uh, met in Ta'if in Saudi Arabia and came up with a new power sharing formula. But for the first time in 2019, we witnessed the national unity from below. It was not leaders coming together, it was the people on the streets coalescing with common demands trying to build a new Lebanon. This is why, even though many are reluctant to use the word revolution, and I think they are right, 
fact, it was an uprising perhaps, it was a protest movement, an intifada, but not a revolution. However, something happened. There was an epistemological break because the Lebanese people, or at least a large segments of the Lebanese people, realized that they wanted to live together and to build a new Lebanon together on a non-sectarian basis. So this popular uprising was very rapidly followed by violent counter-revolutions. One of them was led by Hezbollah. Hezbollah did not accept uh, this uh, popular uprising. And paradoxically, even though Hezbollah has always presented itself as a revolutionary force, uh, when the system came under attack in 2019, Hezbollah very rapidly gave the predominance to its geopolitical interests and jumped to the rescue of some of the Lebanese oligarchs and of some of its allies. And there was a second revolution led by the financial oligarchy that I told you about that torpedoed the Lebanese uh, economic and financial reform. So basically, uh, realism has turned into cynicism and apathy. Realism is often, uh, when they brought together all these militias in a single government and when they offered amnesty in 1991 to all the warlords, it was in the name of realism. And they ended up realizing, we all ended up realizing that because there was no justice, because there was no accountability, we were unable to build a new Lebanon there was a resurgence of sectarianism. This is the ogre of Atta'ifiya uh, being uh, 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 reawakening this sleeping giant, this sleeping beast, particularly after Iraq. And these Lebanese plagues remain the same. Corruption, patronage, clientelism, the spoil system, uh, feudalism. Uh, and Lebanon remains. Uh, a hundred years after the proclamation of the state of Great Lebanon, a house of many mansions. Uh, this is a book by Kamal Salibi, a historian who analyzed the conflicting historiographies of Lebanese sects. Unfortunately, it is still true in 2020. And uh, until we are able to uh, basically build the foundations of a new political system that would provide immunity to Lebanon uh, that would allow Lebanon no longer to be a hostage of regional conflicts and until we also simultaneously uh, get reach a new social contract where uh, social justice is enshrined and economic development goes hand in hand with protection of the weakest segments of the population, I'm afraid that democracy in Lebanon will remain a delusion and stability will remain in elus elusive, will remain out of reach. There are many issues I wanted to talk about, but uh, I got carried, carried up, so I, I, I guess uh, we can discuss this uh, later or take uh, questions. And uh, I would also like to apologize because these slides, it's not uh, the, uh, the final version of my slide. I uh, mistakenly uh, 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 put the wrong one on my USB. So I will send you uh, the up-to-date uh, slides and I will be, would be happy to continue the conversation. Feel free to send me an email if you don't have time to ask the questions uh, today. Thank you again. Thank you, Bara. Thank you, Karim. Thank you all. Thank you, Karim. Yeah. Before we take uh, questions from the audience or comments, uh, very quickly, I mean, definitely, I think uh, you definitely pointed out many of the, you said the plagues or many of the, of the accumulated problems that we've had uh, in Lebanon. And, and, and listening to you, one of the points that you started with, actually, when you talk about the Orientalism, or we could say the Romanticism also to, that we've had towards Lebanon, I think that, yeah, to a great extent, looking at Lebanon through the eyes, through Western eyes, and wanting, wanting to believe that there is this Lebanese exception, also so got us definitely in this kind of optical illusion at the same time, meaning that we believe that it was a country of its kind, a country that was apart, and at the end of the day, we saw these problems accumulating. The things that I have in mind actually are the ones that you mentioned, but between them, let us not forget that the, the, the foundation of Lebanon itself was the National Pact of 1943, and this National Pact gave it to sectarianism, and this sect same sectarianism is the one that rules uh, up to now, unfortunately, at the institutional level, um, I mean. 
Uh, another point is that, yeah, maybe when we look at Lebanon, we look at it too much focusing on Beirut. And actually, it's not the only country with which it happens. When we look at Egypt, we look at Cairo. When we look at, when we look at, um, at Tunisia, we look at Tunis. And we forget that there are some contrasts also within these same countries that happen to provoke this contradiction, meaning that it is not the developed side of the country that should get us to believing that all the country is like this. And I, did, I think that this we're, uh, here we're definitely also uh, responsible of our own, I would say, of, of uh, fooling ourselves by wanting to believe that what is there actually, the, the, what is at the surface of things would reflect what the country uh, is, uh, is about. What I just said, I think that I would extend it to the case of sectarianism in itself. I mean, I'm just wondering, do we really want to be, and when I say we, looking from the Western countries, do we really, do we really want it to be over? I mean, let us look. You mentioned Iraq, for example, 2003. Uh, Saddam Hussein was a dictator. He was overthrown in 2003. But the result that we have today is something that institutionally reminds us also of Lebanon, the president being Kurdish, the prime minister being Sunni, and the, um, uh, the prime minister being uh, Shiite, sorry, and the president of parliament being Sunni, sorry. And this yeah. was actually on purpose. It was deliberately uh, inspired by the Lebanese model, and you had uh, some uh, Lebanese ideologues who were close to uh, the Republican members of Congress who pushed for this idea uh, of uh, entrenching sectarianism uh, in Iraq, and, deep, and this has led to a deepening of the fractures, even though historically you have a strong nationalist uh, identity in Iraq that transcended the sects. You had a lot of uh, uh, Shiite Sunni uh, marriages before uh, in the, between the 1950s and uh, 1990s. You had lo lots of mixed neighborhoods. So there is uh, this trend. Uh, it goes way back. Uh, sectarianism is often manufactured. It's not necessarily uh, they have always been like this. Uh, you mentioned the Orientalist tradition. You have this French uh, famous novelist, Maurice Barrès, who went to Lebanon in uh, the late 19th century and published his uh, Enquête au Pays du Levant, Inquiry in the Levant, and he spent one day with the Druze, one day with the Maronites, etc. And actually, if you read history, I mentioned Usama Makdesi on the age of coexistence, but he also wrote on the culture of sectarianism. We realize that it's not something that is a given in this part of the world. It is very often instrumental for geopolitical interests. And this is something I should have mentioned. It goes back to the French-British uh, rivalry in the 19th century. This is where the Lebanese communities and the Lebanese religious minorities started being used and the first massacres happened in the context of this uh, European rivalry. Yeah, exactly, mid-19th century back then, yeah, where we have, and actually Lebanon maybe reflects on this also, the fact that the way we had these proxy wars that were led through communities, we still have something of it today, and actually one of the questions that, that I had in mind is what about Saudi Arabia and Iran in Lebanon today, like up to two years ago, we were still hearing a lot about the confrontation that were be between them, but today what is it that happened, even Hezbollah in itself, we see the leader of Hezbollah making speeches, still focusing on Israel, also mentioning the situation in Lebanon, but what is it, what is it that um, what is it, where is it that we stand today from this, same, from this same perspective? And one last thing before we get to the audience and their comments and questions is that I was wondering, listening to you, where is France? Where is the international community? Where are all these conferences that were meant to back, to back Lebanon? Even bringing it to these actors that I, talk, uh, I just mentioned, where is Saudi Arabia that you, has its allies, that has been a backer, a supporter of a part of the, of the elite? Because I think that when you say that we, we, you mentioned consortial democracy and then moving to oligarchy, I think that maybe at the same time we've always had a kind of consortial oligarchy that has been prevailing in Lebanon at the same time. There is an intertwining between this community side and between the fact that we're looking for the best way for coexistence to happen there. And unfortunately, as you mentioned it, yeah, we may not, the dreams may be there when it comes to definitely something more peaceful that, that puts sectarian behind us, but at the same time, at what price can this happen? Definitely. Very good question, and I'll just say that uh, you mentioned the international community. You know our colleague in Paris, uh, friend and colleague Pascal Boniface, he often says, that the international community is like the Loch Ness monster. Everyone talks about it, but no one has ever seen it. And it's actually true. It's often used as a euphemism to talk about the United States and its allies. And today you have such a sclerosis at the United Nations that we can no longer talk of an international community. You always have to use uh, so-called uh, so international community. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much.
So uh, if you have any questions, please just raise your hand. We'll, ha we'll hand you a, a, a microphone, and if you can just uh, voice your, your uh, question, either in, in English or in Espanol. Uh, we have translators. No hands. Volunteers. OK. OK, I'll then ask myself a question. Um, I mean, you uh, uh, mentioned, uh, Karim, the, the gridlock that the, uh, the, the current, uh, um, that, that the state is facing, the society is facing. And there is somehow, I mean, you painted a picture where there's pretty much no way of unblocking this gridlock, that there is really like a, a stalemate, a, a, a very, very difficult um, situation in which to unblock it, there, there, there doesn't seem to be like an exit. I don't know where, where can you see, where can you break the, the, the eggs to make the omelette? This uh, is arguably the most important question. The system definitely needs a reboot, but how to get to the reboot? Many Lebanese came to the conclusion that the ruling uh, oligarchs and kleptocrats in Lebanon understand only one language, which is the language of sanctions. This is why uh, many Lebanese intellectuals pleaded with the European Parliament, with the European Union, with the so-called international community uh, to uh, sanction uh, those Lebanese politicians uh, that uh, 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 who, who basically uh, uh, embezzled uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. The problem is that this so-called international community often only uses sanctions to target its political enemies. So uh, for sanctions to be effective, they have to be uh, uh, to target both sides of the political spectrum because the Lebanese people are not naive. Even if they are deeply partisan, they know that corruption exists on both sides of the aisle. So if you use sanctions only to uh, target anti-American or anti-Israel political parties while exonerating uh, US and Saudi allies, you will not reach your objective. However, if we manage to put pressure, and there was one interesting resolution passed by the European Parliament that clearly explained how, and voting by an overwhelming majority of uh, European MPs with the exclusion of the extreme uh, right uh, and uh, some uh, Hungarian uh, MPs, uh, this resolution clearly clearly explained the kleptocratic system at, way, uh, at work, the way these MPs I told you about torpedoed the IMF negotiations. And then you had uh, one example of the US trying to be fair and balanced by sanctioning both uh, a uh, pro-Hariri uh, businessman uh, close to uh, Saudi Arabia and the US and uh, another business uh, person close to uh, the president who is currently aligned with Hezbollah. Uh, however, it is not enough. The, the reboot has to come from Lebanon. Perhaps we need to reach a situation of total collapse because before we build a new Lebanon, but I'm afraid uh, that there is no plan B to an IMF negotiation. And this is also something difficult for me to say because, you know, in Europe, many people criticize the IMF as uh, the neoliberal institutions that will impose austerity measures, etc. But seen from today's Lebanon, what the IMF is actually proposing is much more progressive than what we have in Lebanon and much more protective of the weak and much more in favor of a fair allocation of the losses. So we have reached this stage. It's really paradoxic, but today uh, the IMF has become uh, one of the protectors of uh, the widows and the orphans. So it would make people laugh in Latin America or in other countries where the IMF had put in place some programs, but we have reached such a level of corruption and kleptocracy and uh, impunity in Lebanon uh, where most Lebanese uh, economists, most experts think that there is no plan B. We need to negotiate with the IMF in order to get the $15 billion we need and also because it will impose 
transparency at least, and it will force uh, the politicians to at least set some clear criteria. Today there are no criteria, they are literally trying to save their necks after the collapse. Maybe just on this point we could also add or mention the fact that I think it is today that the UN decided to lift the subsidies that it was giving Absolutely. also when it comes Absolutely. to the fuel, so which may be a problem again for all that relates to the energy. But I mean maybe bringing it to let's say day-to-day -day perspectives, like very basic perspectives, I mean what we hear, what we know now about Lebanon is that of course there is this crisis of liquidity, this crisis of cash. And we hear a lot about, for example, the fact that cryptocurrencies would be the new trends that more and more people would be relying on or trying to rely on. What truth is there in this? Do we see really a reshaping of the way of doing for Lebanese? This is on the one hand. And on the other one, what about networks of solidarity? What about the diaspora? Is there, is there something that is compensating all the losses that we have at the institutional yes, level? Yes, these are two uh, important points. Regarding cryptocurrencies, Lebanese youth uh, are uh, big fans of cryptos. And Lebanon is actually uh, the second country in the entire region right after Turkey in terms of uh, uh, number of transactions. Uh, so this is definitely something that will have to be uh, at the core of the discussions in the next few years following the collapse of the uh, entire uh, banking system. And uh, you also mentioned uh, the Lebanese diaspora. Uh, the Lebanese diaspora has considerable untapped resources. This is what has been allowing uh, over a million Lebanese families to make ends meet because they have family members in Canada or Australia or uh, France or the United States or Africa sending a few hundred dollars every month which, which uh, with the new uh, uh, inflation uh, is a considerable amount in Lebanese uh, pounds. Uh, however, we should resist the temptation of seeing the diaspora as uh, a uh, panacea. Uh, the solution to Lebanon's problem cannot come from the diaspora because uh, there is a disconnect even though many Lebanese expats remain uh, very uh, close to the country, follow the news 24-7. Uh, uh, However, uh, they are not the one paying the price. Uh, it's the old debate on taxation and representation. They send a lot of money to Lebanon uh, they obtain the right to vote, but uh, you still have uh, conflicting agendas. So the solution cannot come from the diaspora. The diaspora can help empower reformers in Lebanon, empower, uh, uh, help uh, bring, uh, bring about change, but it cannot do the job itself because it would be uh, it would be a false assumption to think that a Lebanese person, as soon as he sets foot in Paris or London or Los Angeles, is no longer sectarian, is no longer uh, a fan of his uh, political leader, is no longer uh, a harsh opponent of X or Y. So uh, the diaspora is also divided. However, it is true that it will probably give a small edge to reformist forces in the legislative elections, uh, over 200,000 Lebanese Lebanese uh, are going to vote in the diaspora. It's a considerable number by Lebanese standards. And I assume that there will be uh, a uh, slight uh, uh, bonus to uh, the reformist non-sectarian candidates running in these elections. Great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please, Ellen, go ahead. Um, what kind of relationship does the Lebanese deep state have with sectarianism? Like what I'm thinking of so is do they state. use it to divide and distract from these massive issues that you went in depth about, like the corruption and yeah. the robbing of all of Lebanon's funds? Uh, yes, you nailed it. You're spot on. This is exactly what they do. Uh, they use every dirty trick in the book and uh, the most efficient dirty tricks they have is the politics of fear. 
trying to uh, make an entire community afraid. Uh, they are coming uh, after. They are coming to take your rights. You have to uh, form one united group behind the strong man of your community in order to be protected. And uh, the second uh, thing they use is uh, money. Uh, to, uh, they use their clientelist networks and patronage networks to maintain their political sway. And obviously, they also resort to propaganda. They are the ones who control the country's media. Most TV channels in Lebanon are the property of political parties or receive foreign funding from certain countries or are the property of shady business persons. So with the exception of some alternative media and a few TV channels who are trying to, one or two trying to maintain some sort of balance, most other media outlets have an agenda and the agenda is to protect uh, the uh, elites and the sectarian uh, system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. So the, the governance aspect of the crisis that you are looking at, is this a crisis in the case of Lebanon of national cohesion, of sectarianism, as we know, historical, or, or is this a crisis of the state form itself? Yeah, trying to think beyond. Because two of the most important aspects that stood out for me in your presentation, you make the claim that the, the hyper-centralized state collapses and there's no alternative, but at the same time, the Lebanese people come together as citizens to demand an institutional structure, a form of representation that really recognizes their rights as citizens. So there's something there in the popular imaginary that makes the idea of the state still resilient. And I think I'm not an expert in this region, or my colleague Bara is much more, uh, but I see this double bind beyond this region. We have a crisis of representation, but uh, most social movements or a lot of social movements are pro-democratic, pro demanding more representation, authentic representation. So in terms of the form of organization, um, and the second question or point is you saw 2019 as a, a turning point in, in, in the history of political crisis in, in Lebanon, despite the counter-revolutions that you mentioned. Why do you think this was a turning point from the perspective of the social movement, the popular movement that emerge there. Thank you. These are two very difficult questions, but very sensitive, uh, and they deserve to be uh, debated. There is a uh, uh, a discussion in Lebanon on whether uh, Lebanon is a nation or will never become a nation. In 1920, when there was this proclamation of the state of Great Lebanon, uh, many people, particularly in the peripheral areas, were very reluctant. Many wanted to uh, be part of greater Syria. So many Lebanese uh, rejected this idea of a national cohesion. They did not perceive themselves as Lebanese. And this is something that has changed. We have conducted a, a study at the St. Joseph University of Beirut uh, in the past couple of years, and we have realized that uh, today there is an overwhelming majority of the Lebanese, including in the peripheral areas and in all sects, there is a genuine feeling of belonging to Lebanon. This does not mean, obviously, that we have become a nation state uh, uh, as uh, some would have us believe. However, it would be untrue to think that there is no uh, feeling of uh, wanting to live together. You know, Ernest Renan defined the nation as the vouloir vivre ensemble, willingness to build a nation together. Whether they are Christians or Muslims, most Lebanese, I'm not saying all Lebanese, because you still have some uh, identitarian uh, movements uh, uh, pleading for separation, but most Lebanese uh, do believe in Lebanon. They disagree on how to govern it. Uh, do we need a strong central government? Do we need uh, uh, secularism and decentralization? Do we need to maintain the system? Uh, but they uh, do not look at their fellow Lebanese as rivals or enemies. If you look at uh, politics uh, bottom-up, 
on the grassroots level, you do not have animosities between sects. Even at the highest of the civil war, you had fantastic examples of people living together uh, and uh, resisting together against the sectarian militia. So the problem in Lebanon is not that we have Christians and Muslims who cannot coexist. The problem is that you have a political establishment that is relying on sectarianism in order to maintain its way and that is uh, putting constantly putting fuel on fire in order to maintain uh, to, uh, they want to rule over captive minds and the sectarian mind is a captive mind when you get someone to believe that uh, he can divide the world or divide his nation into us or them it becomes impossible to build a common future. So what we started with, uh, Orientalism is deeply entrenched in Lebanon. There is an attempt to essentialize, to uh, reify communities. And despite these attempts, uh, we see a new generation of Lebanese committed uh, to trying to build a nation, or at least a strong government uh, with a new power sharing formula that would no longer imprison people uh, from uh, birth to, uh, uh, to, to death into uh, being uh, captive and having to go to their religious leader or to their sectarian political leaders and asking for their rights today. This uh, allows me to respond to your second question. Why do I perceive 2019 as a turning point? Because it was perhaps the first time when they demanded their rights as citizens and when we saw solidarity between uh, members of all Lebanese religious groups and willingness to demand uh, a new social contract and to uh, uh, kick out uh, all the uh, political and financial oligarchs. We have seen radical slogans in this revolution. The university where I teach is a rather conservative a Christian university with mostly upper class uh, students. They were very conservative before 2019. And yet, two months after uh, the, the uprising, on the walls on the, uh, in the neighborhood of the university, we had radical slogans calling for LGBT rights, calling for secularism, calling for a complete overhaul of the economic system. So these conservative Christian upper class students suddenly uh, had some sort of an awakening and realized that the system was profoundly unfair. Uh, this is the good news. The bad news is that two years later, uh, things have changed because of the counter-revolution that is underway, because of uh, uh, the uh, uh, attempts by sectarian leaders to uh, play on people's fears, to use the politics of fear. I see some of the same students who had become radical after 2019 going back to their communal instinct and telling me, yes, I was about to join uh, this uh, radical non-sectarian movement, but now I feel that there is a threat on my community and I'm going to vote once again for the strong Maronite, uh, the guy who will protect me, the former warlord, because uh, there are other groups who uh, are uh, becoming uh, uh, too extreme and who are trying to marginalize us. This is obviously a reference to Hasbun. So the fact that Hezbollah did not accept this popular uprising has uh, strengthened uh, the other sectarian leaders. And it was a missed opportunity because within uh, the Shiite community, you had a significant segment that was supportive of this uh, 2019 uprising, supportive of social and economic rights and of uh, a civil state. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think. Muchísimas gracias. Y yo creo que vamos a tener que dejarlo aquí. Ha sido. Thank you. Thank you, Karim Bitar, for this for this uh, uh, amazing. Um, uh, I'd say like. Uh, uh, historic and uh, up-to-date, it's, it's really like a journey 
into into modern uh, Lebanon and how we have come up to uh, to to this to this current to this current state of affairs, uh, which is uh, sadly quite quite dark. Uh, uh, a history of, of missed opportunities like other countries in the region. Uh, different years maybe, but uh, also, uh, as you mentioned, very alarming uh, issues of mental health among the people who feel left out, who feel extremely frustrated by you know, the, uh, the, 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 the missed opportunities or the possibilities that they could have had. Uh, and definitely the that original sin of having been founded as, as a sectarian republic has, has remained a, an imprint that uh, uh, has d determined uh, somehow the, uh, the, the, the history of, 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 this, of this nation. Uh, and again, the Cold War that is looming not only across the Arab countries, but a across the world doesn't seem to, to, uh, to bring good news. Uh, the only good news is that uh, we have uh, brilliant minds like you to try to untangle these issues and we have also the interest of our, uh, the students uh, and, and, other, and other people who have listened across uh, today. So uh, just to, to uh, wrap up, uh, to thank again the Master in uh, Political Science and Public Affairs of the uh, uh, St. Louis University here in Madrid and Bara Mikhail uh, as his uh, representative and uh, of course uh, Karim Bitar for coming here and, and uh, delivering this, uh, this talk today on, on uh, Quo Vadis Lebanon. Uh, you can also watch it again and take more notes or recommend it to friends. It's going to be on our uh, YouTube channel on, on Casa Arabe. Y bueno, pues sin más, desearos una feliz... And without further ado, well, a very good evening to you all. Please follow us. Follow our Aula Arab University. We still have a lot to show you. Thank you. Thank you.